All right. Uh, good morning, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is our third session, I believe, for Emerald Ash 4 University for the fall 2023. Today, we're going to be hosting Dr. Dave Coyle from Clemson University. He's going to talk to us a little bit about Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, Dave, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Bob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, as Bob said, my name is Dave Coyle. I'm with Clemson University. I've been here just over five years now. Uh, and I was one of the uh, fortunate or unfortunate people, depending on your perspective, to be here when Asian longhorn beetles showed up a few years ago. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we are dealing with, uh, what we're doing in terms of regulation research, and then also kind of just where we are in general to get folks on the same page. So before we start, uh, first a disclaimer, I've got lots of facts, but I've also got some opinions on things that do and don't work. And I will give you those opinions when I feel it necessary, but I'll be sure to let you know that it's just Dave's opinion, not something uh, you know factual. So let's dive in. This is the Asian longhorn beetle, Anaplopora glabropenis, native to Asia, as you probably surmised. Highly polyphagous, although it does have some fairly specific host preferences here in North America. It can be eradicated, which is great. It's, it's a very striking beetle. Uh, after a number of years working on bark and ambrosia beetles, it was kind of a welcome relief to have a beetle that was actually large enough to see without a, a magnifying glass. So uh, big black and white things, striped antennae. The feet are actually quite blue uh, if it's dry. The feet on this one don't look that way because I just took it out of some ethanol. But if it's dry, it's got a really nice blue tint to it. So May 2020 is when Asian longhorn beetle was the first discovered in South Carolina down near Charleston. I'll show you a map in a minute, but this is the house where uh, they found it. And there's me doing an actual entomologist thing, looking at uh, the first identified hammered tree that was lit up with uh, exit holes. Uh, this is right down near a little town called Hollywood, South Carolina. And when I would tell people I was going to Hollywood for research, they thought, man, that must be awesome. You get to go to California all the time, but it's actually very different. Look, uh, Hollywood, South Carolina is kind of a, a little sleeper town on the very, very edge of the suburbs of Charleston. So very much uh, blue collar. Uh, you know, a lot of people live there and commute in, and there's also some regular small businesses as well. Full, full disclosure, it was awesome. You know, when we first got this thing, uh, it was really, really exciting for me as a trained forest entomologist. This was basically me thinking, oh my gosh, everything I've trained for is happening. And this was Stephen Long, who worked with our state regulatory agency. So on one hand, when I got the call, I was very excited. Um, on the other hand, I also knew enough to know that this was going to be a long slog and not going to be a great thing to be, you know, to be happening in the state. So very much mixed emotions. So there were lots of beetles initially. You could go down there and see these things all the all the time. Uh, this was in 2020, so you'd have these adults just chew these oviposition sites into the bark, typically maples, and so they would chew these little pits in there, and then they would turn around and lay an egg. And sometimes you just have rows of these things going up and down trees. This was in uh, typically June is when the adults will lay eggs, maybe late May. After those eggs hatch and the larvae start feeding you'll see bleeding on these trees. And this is uh, late June through July, even into August. Very easy to identify infested trees. You have these big black streaks running down the sides of them. The larvae feed in the phloem for a little while. And then uh, after a few weeks, they turn and they go straight into the xylem, into the wood of the tree. And at this point, you will see sawdust and shavings getting pushed out. And so you can see a couple pictures here. This is feeding from the older larvae. They, you know, the sawdust and shavings covered basically everything at the base of that tree. It, it dripped down onto plants, spider webs. Uh, it would pile up at the base of the tree, sometimes two, three inches thick of just sawdust and wood shavings down there. So on trees with very active larval, uh, larval activity, lots and lots of wood shavings. And then this this is really where the big damage comes in. Um, the larvae, a single larva does not consume a whole lot of phloem. Uh, if that was all it did, the tree would probably survive. But when you've got larvae that are, you know, some of these things can get almost as big as your pinky, and they are basically just Swiss cheesing the wood uh, of the branches of the stem. And it kind of, well, A, it causes a lot of breakage. Uh, it also messes with how the water gets transported in that tree. And those so these trees kind of slowly die from the top or top down or the edges in. 
I mentioned the broken branches. This is a really, really major issue. Uh, a lot of times these trees are going to be in areas where people are living. We're talking about neighborhoods, cities. Uh, so it's not a place where you can just have branches falling. Very similar to emerald ash borer in that respect. We've got a lot of maples are found in uh, places where people live. So branch breakage was a huge, huge issue for us. This is the end of that branch I just, uh, just showed you. You can see my hand on the left. So you can see kind of how big this thing is. And here are some arrows that are pointing to every one of the larval galleries in the end of that branch. You can actually see through that one on the top. Uh, and it just, you know, this is very standard damage for what those older larvae will do to a tree, to a branch, and it causes lots of breakage. Here you can see one just sort of hanging up there. So in areas where you've got a lot of these Asian longhorn beetles and a lot of damage, you don't want to be in there where it's windy. Um, those of you familiar with coastal weather and coastal weather patterns, we have a lot of hurricanes in this part of the world. So every time there's a hurricane, uh, there's kind of a collective holding of the breath to see what's going to fall out of the trees at that point. A lot of times you can actually see the exit hole because the, the female will lay that egg and they will kind of gallery their way up and then come out of that a few inches ahead. So a lot of times you'll actually see this perfectly round exit hole just above where it broke. That exit hole is roughly the diameter of a number two pencil. So you can stick one of those in there, usually a inch, inch and a half or so. It goes in that deep because the larvae are coming kind of from the middle of that branch or that tree. And so it's very much perpendicular to the, the outside of the tree. And there's another shot of the exit hole. The adults feed a little bit. Uh, it's pretty inconsequential. They tend to nibble on the that green bark on epicormic sprouts and epicormic shoots. And then you can see a couple of position sites there too. So yes, the adults feed. Again, similar to emerald ash borer, the adult feeding is negligible. The real issue is that uh, larval feeding, which causes all the branch breakage. And then since this is a federally regulated pest, you know, you can prevent it to some extent with insecticides, but by the time a tree has it, that tree is coming down. There's no saving a tree once it has Asian longhorn beetle because of the regulation. So that is one of the things that uh, was very, uh, we had to tell people a lot of times, that even though you think you can save that tree, if it's been called positive for ALB, it's got to come down. We have several lookalikes here in South Carolina. You can see an ALB there with an arrow. We have large Eastern eyed click beetles. Uh, cottonwood borers, a lot of monocamus, which are pine pests, but we have lots of pine in this part of the world. So these monocamus uh, species are all over the place. And if we're being honest, to the to most untrained eyes, a great big black beetle looks like any great big black bug. So when we were first putting out our calls for, you know, did you see this beetle? We got lots and lots of different things. That's just sort of the nature of the beast. And there's even a good bit of uh, variation in size with Asian longhorn beetles. So you can see two males here on the left, two females on the right. So even, you know, within a species, there's lots and lots of variation, kind of like with people, right? There's lots of variation how big people get, lots of variation how big these beetles get as well. Where is Asian longhorn beetle? Well, obviously we have it down here in South Carolina. Here's our, our spot. Again, this is just uh, just down uh, south of Charleston, South Carolina, but north of Savannah, Georgia, if that helps as well. So on this map, the red spots are active, uh, active infestations, green or not. So we've got active in South Carolina, active in Ohio still, and then a couple more active up in the northeastern part of the country. And we do have a, you know, we've done, it worked a lot with our regulatory folks. If we We've set up a, a whole online reporting thing. If people think they've seen one, you can send a picture. You can just make a report and someone will come and check that out. The details of the regulatory aspect. We have a quarantine area, federal quarantine area. That means certain things cannot be moved outside that area. Specifically, you can't move the beetle or any life stage of it outside the area. Hopefully that's obvious. You also cannot move any host material that that beetle might use outside of that area. Um, and so we're looking at 76, about 76 square miles. So far, they have surveyed about 77,000 trees. And of those, 
8,400 have been uh, infested, about 5,000 have been removed, and then we also remove some high risk hosts. So that means, let's say you have a yard with five maple trees in it. Four of them are heavily infested. One tree is not yet infested. That is considered a high risk host because the odds of it becoming infested are extremely high. That tree is just gonna get cut down as well. So at this point, really, you know, the only way to get rid of this beetle is just host removal. And speaking of host removal, they love maples. So it makes it fairly easy to survey for them because we know, you know, we've looked at the data from South Carolina, 98% of what they hit are maple trees. Of that 98%, about 97.5% is going to be red maple. And then there's just a sprinkling of silver maple, sugar maple. There might be a Florida maple in there. Other things they hit are going to be populous. So the cottonwoods, salix, which is the willows, uh, birches, the occasional elm and occasional sycamore. And that's pretty much it. But again, all those other things are, are basically 2% of all the hosts. Maple is what they're after here not just in South Carolina, but also in the Northern part and other infestations as well. It's almost, almost all maple. So the big question has been, how did Asian longhorn beetle get to South Carolina? This is the furthest South this beetle has been established in North America. And so we, you know, early on, we've worked very closely with USDA APHIS they did some genetic work and they found that the population genetics of that first beetle we found matched the population in Ohio. Okay, so that gives us a couple options of how this might have happened. First of all, I always thought for a long time it was some spiteful Ohio State fan because when we found this, remember, Ohio State was 0-4 against Clemson. So I thought, well, maybe this is some sort of, you know, spite thing going on. Of course, they subsequently beat them. Uh, and laid an egg in the national championship. And I must say, I'm an avid Badger fan. I went to UW-Madison for my PhD, so I will take jabs at Ohio State any chance I get. Now, that's one possibility, but could also be from Asian longhorn beetles' native range, which is China and the Koreas. We've got some ports along here. I'll talk about that in a minute. It could also have come from Europe, because Europe has all sorts of Asian longhorn beetle infestation uh, or populations, I should say, as well. I mentioned we've got lots of ports here. We've got the Port of Charleston, which is probably not even 20 miles from the infestation zone. The Port of Savannah, which is a really, really large one, is about 90 miles away. This area where Asian Longhorn Beetle is found has got a lot of construction. It is a rapidly, rapidly expanding um, housing market. There are always things being built. There's always lots of pallets, lots of dunnage, lots of great big spools with wires on. So all sorts of the, the solid wood packing material that could be used or, or could be, um, you know, used by the beetle to get somewhere, it's around here. So lots of that, that's always a possibility. But there's also an RV park right next, <clears throat> excuse me, right next to where that initial, uh, that beetle was found in that neighborhood. We have a railroad going through here. And if anyone's familiar with Highway 17, this is what goes from down the coast from Myrtle Beach to Charleston to Hilton Head to Savannah. High, high, high rates of tourism. Uh, so we basically have every possible mechanism that would facilitate Asian longhorn beetle getting somewhere. Okay, we've got the ports, we've got the tourism, we've got the railroad, we've got the RV park, all of that stuff. Long story short is we don't know the origin, okay? But if I had to guess, again, my opinion, it probably came on firewood from Ohio. Uh, and I say that because we know that visitors to this part of the state are large, there's a large chunk from Ohio. Again, there's an RV park right there, genetics match. That's, uh, you know, the path of least resistance, Occam's razor, it probably came from there. But again, we will never know, okay? Now, is all hope lost? This is an invasion curve. so. This is a, a nice figure that shows how invasive species populations typically work. Okay, so on the left, uh, which would be your y-axis, you have the area infested. So as more area is infested, you go up the chart. And on the bottom, which is your x-axis, time goes from left to right. So as you go left to right, more time has passed. So at some point, right down there where it says introduction, 
you have very little area infested and you have very little time has passed because at some point the first thing gets there and that's what it is. Um, and then as time passes, whatever species this is, those populations are gonna grow. And then it usually is, you know, it will be detected at some point. Most of the time you can still eradicate. If you were to, to put an eradication plan in place, the minute you detected something, it's often possible to, 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 to actually eradicate the thing. This only works if you know how to eradicate it, right? So you can, you can look at any of these big invasives we've had, emerald ash borer, spotted lanternfly, pick one. You know, we found it early-ish, but at those, for those, we didn't know what to do yet, right? As time goes on, and again, you're going up this curve, you know, there becomes a point where the population and area gets so large, the infested area is so large that you're just not ever going to eradicate that thing. Um, at that point, that's usually when public awareness begins, right? That's when people start losing trees in this case. And, and you know, at that point, you know, local management is all that's going to happen. For anything else like this that would take lots and lots of money, that means you're asking our federal government to put money in to try to control some of these things, which takes even longer. So this is just a, a, the general reason why it's so hard to control invasive things once they are here, once they're established. Now, there's a difference though. I'm showing you this because I want to tell you about Asian longhorn beetles. So in this case, we found ALB uh, and we determined that it was probably introduced in 2013. Okay, so we can do that by taking one of those exit holes and if you saw through, you can count the tree rings and you can see what year it got here. So we know uh, that ALB got here at least by 2013, detected seven years later. But the big difference is public awareness began immediately. Like we knew the minute the press release got out, all our public stuff was out already. And we already know, since this is not the first time this pest has showed up in North America, we know how to eradicate it. We know what it takes. And let's look back at this map a little bit. You've had these, you know, this one um, in Chicago, there was a, an infestation a while back that was eradicated. You've got one of them in Ohio eradicated. You've got a bunch of green boxes up in the Northeast eradicated, right? So the, the question, can we eradicate ALB is a resounding yes. Absolutely, we can, talk, we can eradicate ALB. Um, it takes a little work and a lot of times at this point, it's host removal is what we do to eradicate it. But, uh, you know, we are working on that. So that's the general state of our infestation right now. I can tell you anecdotally, the populations have gone down quite a bit since they did in May 20. Uh, in May 20, I was going down there every week. Remember, this was the peak of COVID in May of 20. So uh, no one was really staying overnight in hotels. So I was just making a long day trip once a week. Um, not uncommon to find two, three adults just walking around, and it's been very hard the last year or two to even find adults uh, out there. So uh, we know they're there, but it's just populations are not what they were. So as such, we've done a lot of research. So let's talk about some of that research. What are we doing here? So first of all, when you're working with a pest like this, we partner very heavily with the USDA, with Forest Service with APHIS, with our state agencies, there's two main questions. I look at this as there's two main goals that we're trying to figure out. One, can we improve current management tactics? Meaning, can we figure out something better to do with the stuff we have now? Okay, what can we do better uh, than we're doing now? And then the second one is, how can we improve our ability to detect this species now or detect it elsewhere in the future, right? So those are kind of your two things. Can you help now or can you help in the future? And those are the two different sort of hallways that I like to think that our research goes down. It's one or two. It is a massive, massive group effort. Um, our state regulatory folks are actually housed underneath the Clemson umbrella. That's why I see a tiger paw there. For a lot of people, it's with the State Department of Ag, but South Carolina is set up a little different, but we work with multiple groups at Clemson, USDA, State Forestry Commission, our College of Charleston, which is local college right there, uh, NC State, the Davy Resource Group helps us with a lot of our tree removals, both for regulatory purposes, but also for uh, research purposes. And then Charleston County Parks have been incredibly uh, helpful to us in giving us sites to do some of this research. 
So when we're trying to figure out some of these questions, it needs to be said that this research is not easy. It's some of the most challenging research that I've done for a number of reasons. First of all, the clock is ticking from day one because as soon as ALB is found, the plan is put in place to eradicate it. So there's this is good, right? We know how to eradicate ALB. As soon as we found it, we already had a plan. To, okay, we got to get the tree cutters down there. We got to start removing hosts because we can eradicate this thing. Um, it also makes it a little trickier, though, because you're going to need permits to do some of these things, right? So we, we're a little bit limited in what we can do. And that's the second challenge with ALB research is the quarantine zone. We cannot take infested material outside of that zone unless it's been treated, right? So that means we cannot set up a lab colony in at my lab in Clemson. It's all got to be four hours away down there inside that quarantine zone. So it makes things just a little bit trickier. And probably the most challenging part is just simply finding that study organism. Uh, it's not hard to find one or two, but to find the amount that you need to do research takes a good bit of effort. Um, if you're gonna find larvae, you're looking at peeling bark and splitting logs. Um, and if you want adults, you've either got to hand capture them or you've got to try to trap for them. And I'm not going to talk about trapping yet. We'll get to that maybe in the end if there's time, but long story short, it doesn't work very well. Okay, so it's tough to get these things. That said, we've got a great team that's been put together. We've had a couple students graduate already, several more working on lots of things. And frankly, none of this happens without my the, the amazing technicians we have working on this project. So let's talk about some of the different things we're doing down here in South Carolina. Meredith had been looking at population dynamics, and this is one of those questions to help with future uh, future infestations. How does this, how do populations grow and how do they move, okay? Lena has been looking at phenology and Marina has been looking at if there's any possible possibility of biocontrol. And then Abby has been looking at if there's maybe a new management strategy we can use down here in South Carolina. So I'm gonna go in order. Let's talk about some of these first off. How do Asian longhorn beetle populations expand on the landscape or within a tree? This is a good question because, again, this, uh, this is the furthest south Asian longhorn beetle has been found in North America, right? So if, if you've ever had a population biology class, uh, you might know that to really do a good study on how populations grow, you need an island population. You need a population that is, is separate from kind of everything else. It's got a bunch of different host material on there, but not all of the host material has been used yet. Because once a once a pest uses up all its hosts, it starts to change behavior. Well, lo and behold, we had an actual island that was uh, partially infested with Asian longhorn beetle. So it, it made the perfect scenario for this. So this is down here in Charleston County. Here's a great view of the island at the end of the walkway. And this is Meredith Beans. This was her project. And so this island had several... Heavily, heavily infested, lightly infested, and uninfested host trees. So what we did was we cut every one of those down and we recreated that whole outbreak, that whole infestation. So Davy Resource Group helped us. Each tree was labeled, geo-referenced. Uh, they were it was carefully cut down, and then the pieces were all matched up. So we knew where everything went, and then painstakingly and meticulously, everything was hauled off the island. Uh, on, on gators and carts, okay? So 34 trees in all. At the end of it, here is Meredith in her red coat with all of her study trees. This is a really, really impressive project she did. And so once we got everything back and this place back was within our quarantine zone. So we were allowed to have our stuff here. And behind you, you see, behind that, you see the little field research lab they sort of had. She basically recreated every tree like you would recreate a dinosaur, okay? And from that, she recorded how many exit holes were on those trees and where they were, and how many egg sites were on those trees and also where they were. And this is going to allow us to, again, recreate, you know, we'll find the start of the infestation and then recreate it as it grows out, okay? She, she cataloged a lot of stuff. You're looking at almost 15,000 different egg sites and uh, over 1,600 adult exit holes holes is what she cataloged. And when she got those holes, not only did she see where they were on the tree in terms of diameter uh, and height, but also she looked at them and figured out how old those holes were. 
So this is a few different exit holes. You can see up on the top is a really fresh one. But because, you know, we have a long growing season in this part of the world, it's almost 10 months, probably over 10 months in some years. Uh, maples grow very fast and sometimes they will heal up uh, that hole altogether. But if you take this hole and you cut it right down uh, the middle like that and you sand it real nice, you can actually count the growth rings and you can figure out what year that tree uh, died or what year that, sorry, what year that exit hole was made. So what year did that adult come out? And with that, now you've got time data, right? You can determine how old this infestation was. So putting all of that together, this is what uh, Meredith found. It's some really great stuff. So what we found was if you look at just tree height, beetles don't really like the very bottom. They don't really like the very top. They like the middle. And so this seems may seem boring and obvious, but if you're looking at when you think about the way we typically find Asian longhorn beetles with visual surveys, with people out there using their eyes, using binoculars. So anything we can figure out to help tell them where to target their viewing is going to help save some time. And so whether it's a single stem tree or a multiple stem tree, there's kind of a sweet spot in the middle. And that's where you want to focus your effort as a surveyor. So from this, we know that, you know, the multi-stem trees had a lot more damage than those single stem trees. And you're looking at the middle 50% of a host tree's canopy uh, or branches smaller than 10 inches diameter. So they like stuff that's about that big in this range. It's like, it's the stuff with smooth bark. It's not the stuff that's quite so big, not the stuff that's quite so little. So this is all stuff that's gonna help information that's gonna help those surveyors use their time a little more wisely. And then when we look at the vertical and spatial spread, how fast did these things spread out? There was a model done uh, a while ago um, that basically looks at if you have a starting point to here, how long before that spreads to these other things. We were able to put that, apply that model to this island. Again, here's an aerial view of the island and all the uh, affected trees. And then we compared it with what actually happened. So the stuff on the right is what actually happened, where they went from point A to point B. And remember, she figured all this out because she knows the year in which those exit holes were created. And what we found was they actually moved faster and farther down here than they did, uh, than the model would predict. It wasn't too much. So I would say the model is pretty good, but still it was a, it was a good bit. I believe uh, the model predicted about 25 meters a year and we found 38 meters a year, which is a fairly good distance. But in the overall scheme of things, the model is pretty, pretty well. So that said, we now know that if there are other infestations that happen in the, the southern part of the country, we need to consider these things in terms of how fast these populations might go and where we might look for them. So the next, uh, to me, fairly obvious question is, well, how does this climate impact ALB phenology, right? We're in, a, we're in a place here where there really isn't a winter. It gets cool. I would say cool. And originally from the Midwest rarely, rarely, rarely snows, rarely frosts. Um, so it's not like anywhere else where ALB is, uh, the Northeast, Ohio, we've got a dedicated winter. What does it mean for South Carolina to have such a long growing season, such a mild winter? If these are spreading faster than we think, it could make eradication more difficult. If there's a very fast life cycle, fast generation, that means you're not gonna have the same life stages present at every time during the year like we have every other infestation in North America. And if we've got life stage specific control methods, we need to make sure we have them out at the right time. So what we first need to do is just figure out, look, what kind of life cycle is going on down here? And this was initially spurned by this map, which was made a few years back. And it showed that, uh, and again, Lena Schmidt is gonna be working on this, this predicted that in this part of South Carolina, you can have um, less than a year to have a full mature Asian longhorn beetle life cycle, right? So 0. 0.59 years, you're looking at six, it's probably seven months, eight months or so. If Asian longhorn beetle is completing its life cycle in eight months, that is a very different beast than something that does uh, a full one or two year life cycle, okay? So what Lena did was she collected every month. Uh, I believe she got 24 straight months of collections, which is awesome. Um, simply cutting down infested material, bringing it back, peeling the bark, 
splitting the stuff on the log splitter, excising and taking out those larvae. Once she got the larvae out, she measured the head capsule width. So this is a part of the larva that once it molts, it stays the same size the whole time. The rest of the body gets bigger and then it molts again. And so those head capsules make these jumps every time there's a new larval stage. They go boop, boop, boop. Um, so she also recorded when eggs were present and how many when pupae were present. And because it's so hard to find adults, we just looked at, did anyone see an adult in a particular month, whether that was our rich crew, the regulatory crew, whomever, and we just sort of have those bulk adult measurements. Again, she got data from August 21 through July 23 in total. Uh, you know, what is that? Almost 1,200 individuals. So we got a really good sample size there. All different uh, stages were found. And at the end of it, and I'm, I'm giving you one year right here, it was a pretty consistent one year life cycle. Okay, so you have, uh, we'll start with the eggs are primarily laid in late May and June and July. And then you've got larvae happening from uh, July all the way through April. And then April, May, you've got uh, pupae. And then you've got adults basically May, June, July, and August. And that's pretty much a one year cycle happened in both years. What we did notice though, is there's lots of developmental plasticity, lots of, of variation in how these things develop. And for instance, these are larvae that were all found in November 21. Those are clearly different instars. One is extremely, you know, extremely mature for a larva. Uh, the others are quite new. And then here's another shot in April of 22, where we had probably three larvae and a pupa all at the same time. So lots of plasticity. We're still looking at some of these things. But when you put it into this program, it basically tells you that you've got five humps on this black line. It's more than likely five instars here in South Carolina. So when you put all this together, it was great work by Landon. She's getting ready to defend here in another three weeks, actually. Here's to be a one-year life cycle, but there is some variation. Uh, the flight season seems to be late May, even to September, November. That first year, we saw them really late. I will say the last couple of years, it's basically been late May through July has been pretty much when we've seen the adults, um, likely five instars. So this these data will feed back into this map. We'll probably get some updating. And Lindsay has just joined the lab as of about a month ago, and she is going to do uh, look a little more closely at some of these fall larval populations where we had all that variation to try to see what we might be able to figure out in terms of what's happening there. Marina has been looking at biocontrol and she's worked hard for two years. She'll be graduating this spring. She did a number of things. She did just collections of logs where she collected any larvae inside there, reared them out to see what came. She had these sentinel logs where you actually take a piece of a red maple log, you cut a little canoe in there. You could put an ALB larva in, seal it back up and the larva just starts feeding. And then you put those out and see if you can basically bait in uh, parasitoids. She did lots of trials, no parasitization really here. There was one tachinid fly, a very generalist uh, parasite, or I should say predator that we did find. But more excitingly, she released some Ontsyromelopes from uh, our, with our collaborators, the USDA ARS. This was just uh, about a month ago and we did see some parasitization. So there might be some chance here. Um, you know, I, I, we are under no illusions that biocontrol is going to eradicate ALB. This is a tactic that we could use maybe on the late ends when there's, uh, you know, when the populations are hard to find, just having these out here is going to provide some control. Uh, and, uh, you know, for anything like this, something is going to be better than nothing. Now let's move to management strategies, some other management strategies. I was working with uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kelly Oten. Up at NC State, and we brought on Abby. One challenge we have in South Carolina is the picture where I'm standing is what a lot of areas look like where red maple is growing. These areas are not areas that you'll be able to drive in the chipper trucks to drive in the equipment, um, lots of standing water. And so how do you deal with removing this host, removing high-risk hosts when you've got you know, one, two, three feet of standing water on the ground. Uh, it's very different from a neighborhood where you can just drive the equipment up the street. 
cut the trees down, walk them over and shove them through the chipper. That is just simply not going to happen here. So again, we know that remove and ship is your standard method of uh, eradication. We started wondering, well, what happens if you just cut the trees and walk away, or if you just kill the trees and let them stand? Our thinking was that it's so warm here and so humid here, and we've got so much uh, in the terms of the decomposer community here, would the trees actually become unusable as hosts before that generation of beetles made it through uh, to adulthood? You know, this is this, and this is like I say, I know this is a cheesy jet, but it's this is the science that we're trying to do that will hopefully make a difference here. So what we ended up doing was uh, Abby put her treatments in in May 21. I'll tell you about those in a minute. And she sampled quarterly. We identified all the larvae. She graduated last fall. Great job, Abby. So. The alternative treatments we tried, we had some control trees and we had what we just called hack and squirt trees, where you just cut a little notch in the side of the tree, squirt some herbicide in there and the tree dies standing up. We also had treatments where we just cut the tree down and left it on the ground. And we had treatments where we cut the tree down and then we cut it up into about four foot sections. Uh, we use four feet um, for a couple of reasons. One, that is the official uh, definition of firewood. And two, that is going to give us more exposure where uh, the decomposer community could possibly get into that tree, whether it's fungus, whether it's ambrosia beetles, that type of thing. So that was our whole question is, if you cut these down in May or you apply these treatments in May when there's probably eggs, will the tree degrade faster than the larva will, uh, will develop? Okay. So again, these were her three treatments plus control. Every quarter she came and she, you know, destructively sampled a quarter of them, the whole thing. So it was about, I think she had about 50 trees in total. Lots of, of wood. I'm not calling it firewood. You can't burn this stuff. It all gets chipped up because of regulations and that type of thing. But lots of materials generated. We saw lots of decomposer activity very, very, very quickly. Uh, everything from different fungi to native wood boring things. To ambrosia beetles, all these little these old noodles here from ambrosia beetles all the time. So they were very, very, very common. And what we found at the end of the day uh, was actually pretty cool. And any treatment where the tree was on the ground, we got no adults from them. So uh, we are optimistic. We are doing some more work now with Courtney. She is working with Kelly and I, and this is her PhD. So we're trying to see if this is something that we can lean on in the future in some of these more hard to get at areas. Uh, so some, some preliminary take home messages here. The way it got to South Carolina is very likely from human mediated movement, okay? Uh, I do think we're making very good progress on eradication, uh, great progress on research for sure. And you know, one thing that I think sets us apart from some of the other, um, the other infestations has been the communication that we've had among groups, uh, professional groups, and landowner groups for certain. And we've had a really, really good uh, relationship from the get-go. I'll make a quick plug that we are looking for a postdoc to do uh, some data, data wrangling. So if anyone is looking for a postdoc out there, let me know. And I do, Bob, I do have some more. I want to talk about trapping, but I want to give people a chance for any questions right now. So are there any questions so far before I get into the trapping thing? And remember, just go ahead and put them in the chat, um, or I guess you could go ahead and unmute right now since we are through our presentation for the most part. Not a single question. Is it that good? It's amazing. You're doing your job great. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> well, well, we've got plenty of time, so if you yeah, want to dive yeah. into so, trapping. So I want to talk about one more thing. I want to talk about trapping, and I mentioned it earlier that... Um, you know, the only way to find Asian longhorn beetle adults is either to, to physically see them and find them and catch them or to trap them. And typically we trap everything, right? In entomology, anytime we're trying to monitor something, we set up a trapping protocol and we do this and we can catch them by the dozens or hundreds or what have you. So let's talk about trapping with Asian longhorn beetle. They have been working on this. They, we, we have all been working on this, the collective group for well over 20 years, okay? And this has involved a lot of different partners, uh, a lot of extremely smart people, some of the best serambicid 
trapping people in the in the country and world have worked on Asian longhorn beetle trapping. Okay. Um, I uh, basically every possible thing has been evaluated in terms of how can we make a trap that works. Everything from the type of trap, the colors, the shapes, etc. And you saw this with when Emerald Ashmore first hit. We went through white traps and green traps and different shape traps and eventually settled on the purple prism, right? So a similar methodology protocol was employed, was used for Asian longhorn beetle. We looked at placement. Does it need to be low? Does it need to be high on the bowl, hanging somewhere else? The lures, right? There's been people that have made entire careers trying to figure out what lure will work, what chemical lure will work for Asian longhorn beetle. It's been tested in multiple locations. Basically everywhere there was an ALB population, trapping trials were conducted, okay, to try to find these things. And then even other things uh, have been used, like can we make clay models of female Asian longhorn beetles to draw in the males, okay? So everything that I can think of has been tried. It seemed like we were perpetually this, right, this close. We needed one more component to this, you know, one more chemical component, one more anti-isomer or anti-isomer, one more semiochemical, one more trial to just hammer things down. And so when we got our population in 2020, these things, again, we were catching, I was catching two or three every week, just walking around on this one road. And so these were super, super high populations. And so, you know, I reached out to some people and the thinking was, look, if it, if trapping doesn't work in this environment, it's probably not going to work, right? So just because look at all the beetles around here. So flashback to 2020, if you remember, this was uh, the height of COVID. Those of us that had children, we were wondering what was our fate as a parent at that point, but we managed to get through it. Um, and so I set up this trial and my buddy, Kevin Chase with Bartlett helped out that one time. And remember, this is back when everyone's wearing masks in the, in the outside and I will just tell you that uh, wearing a mask in August in Charleston County, South Carolina, was not pleasant in any way, shape, or form. It's just it's just lots of humidity and lots of growth that's happening there. But traps were established. Um, I put them up for 10 weeks, checked them weekly. We had two chemical treatments plus a control, 15 traps per treatment. So that gives us a total of 450 trap weeks. Okay, so weeks per trap. Um, I know there are beetles in there because this is sawdust that was raining down on my trap from the tree above. So that means, remember, it was it was filled with older larvae at that point. Uh, we also got some cool stuff you don't get anywhere else. Little, little crabs were all over the ones that were close to the water. So that was kind of fun. So my thinking was setting up this trapping experiment is we've got these heavy populations that uh, this is going to be the time. And I'm going to be the guy that figures out trapping, right? So as we started this thing in 2020, this is when I put them up. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to catch so many beetles and we're going to figure this out. As weeks progressed and I wasn't catching beetles, I was kind of thinking, well, what is going on here? Like, what is happening? Are the, are the lures not working? Is What is wrong? And then when I stopped it in October, it was the biggest frustration that I think I've ever had as a scientist because I was convinced this was going to work. And at the end of the day, I caught two total adult beetles, okay? One of these beetles was in, was in a control trap, which means it just wandered in. And the other one I caught in a lure. So obviously there's no statistical significant anything with that, right? So these did not work uh, at all. Um, the big question then being, why did these not work? And I think if you have to, if I had to think about it, Asian longhorn beetles use cues from sort of three different stimuli, visual, touch, scent, chemical, right? You can only get one of those into a lure. You can get the chemical in there. You're not going to get the visual in there. You're not going to get uh, the touch in there as well. There's been, you know, the more you talk to people, when people watch Asian longhorn beetles find a mate, they fly to a particular tree, they land on it, they tend to then follow up uh, the trail of another one, like a male will land and follow a female trail up. And then there's some visual and, and tactile stuff that happens. And I think it's just impossible. It seems to me impossible to put all that into a lure. And I know some will say, what about all those studies out there that show significantly statistic impact 
of these lures on trap captures. Um, when you dig into those numbers, it usually is a difference between something like 0.5 beetles per trap per day and 0.2 beetles per trap per day. None of that matters. That Both of those are inefficient traps that just simply do not work. And I think at the end of the day, it's important that we just you know, cut the cord at some point when we need to. And I've been a strong advocate that trapping does not work and we need to move on for that. And I think this, um, we, we just finished up another trapping study just a couple of weeks ago, got absolutely nothing. Um, I just think, you know, sometimes uh, it's time and knowing when to let something go is a, is a valuable trait. And I think that's where we are with trapping. So there's my soapbox on trapping and Bob, for real, that is the end of my talk at this point. So I would be happy to take any questions or any other thoughts folks might have. Uh, thank you for sharing all that. I found that really, really interesting. Having I used to work on the Emerald Ash Borer trapping effort 15 years ago when it first showed up in Indiana. So I understand some of the struggles. Yeah. And it can be hard for people to let it go too, which I, I get if that was, if that was my baby, like if my baby was developing lures, I would always think we're almost there too. But I think one of the one of the things that I, you know, and I'm the newest sort of member to the Asian Longhorn Beetle Club, so to speak, right? I've only been here for three years, but I think there was a it's been a benefit to come in with a very clear, open, objective mind and look at look at what is there and what is and is not working. And I think that's I, I think it, the program's grown overall, um, but I think it was good to get some fresh, fresh eyes on some things.